All right, welcome back. This is going to be our uh, final session for the day with Scott Powell. Scott is uh, tuning in from the warm and friendly state of Florida. And uh, I think this is how we'll, we'll do it. We're gonna have Scott give a, a, a short presentation. Uh, he's been writing and, and thinking and, and, uh, and creating content about uh, cultural Marxism um, and, uh, and, and its kind of development over time and, and what's happening now in the United States. So I'm gonna kick it uh, over to Scott. Uh, Scott is gonna speak for uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And then if you have questions, pop them in the Q&A channel. And then uh, after Scott is done with his uh, sh short presentation, uh, I'll be moderating some questions and discussion. So uh, without further ado, uh, Discovery Institute Research Fellow Scott Powell, um, take it away. All right, wonderful. Well, I, I, I wanna keep this brief because I think Q&A will be more engaging. Uh, and I'll just cover, I think, three things, three major things. First, uh, I'll just recap what traditional Marxism uh, was in theory, what, uh, how cultural Marxism developed, and then I want to talk about where we are today. Uh, and of course, many of you already know many of these points, but I'll just recap that, you know, the Communist Manifesto was Marx's central work. It was, it was written in 1847. And the main tenets of this so-called uh, original Marxism was, of course, conflict um, from the contra for contradictory forces of labor and capital. And there would be class struggle of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the pro proletariat being the worker, the bourgeoisie being the owner of the capital. And, and the belief was that the, that the labor class, the proletariat, would rise up and overthrow the bourgeoisie uh, the owners of the capital, and then seize the means of production, eliminate private property, and create a new social order that would equi equitably distribute resources from each according to their need, or to their from each according to their ability, and to each according to their need. We never really heard much from Marx about how you'd get there, but that was the basic theory. Now, <clears throat> um, Oftentimes when people talk about Marx, they also talk about Lenin because Marxism, Leninism really became the means by which the uh, socialist communist revolution uh, would be accomplished. And, you know, as, as Lenin was consolidating power in Russia, there was another uh, th a theoretician named Antonio Gramsci and he was emerging as a leading Marxist theoretician in Italy. He founded actually the Communist Party in Italy in 1921. And after being imprisoned by Mussolini, the fascist prime minister of Italy at the time, Gramsci uh, authored what came to be known the prison notebooks. And they were partially published in 1947 and then the complete works were published in 1975. And it was a legacy that made him one of the most important Marxist thinkers of the 20th century. He argued that uh, the communist route to taking power in developed industrialized societies such as Europe and the United States would be best accomplished by a long march through the institutions. This would be a gradual process of radicalization of the cultural institutions, what he called the superstructure of the bourgeoisie of the bourgeois society. And it would be a process uh, that would in turn transform the values and morals of society. Gramsci believed that as society's morals were softened, its political and economic foundation would be more easily smashed and restructured. Now, cultural Marxism was also in vogue uh, separately from Gramsci, although there was communication and there was sharing of theory, at the Institute of Social Research in Frankfurt, uh, at the Frankfurt University in Germany. That is until about 1933, when the Nazis came to power. <clears throat> Many of the members of the Frankfurt School, such as Herbert Marcuse, Eric Fromm, Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, and William Reich fit, fled to the United States, where they ultimately found their way into professorships at various elite universities such as Berkeley, Columbia, Princeton. <clears throat> in the context of American culture, the long march through the institutions meant, in the words of Herbert Marcuse, 
quote, working against the established institutions while working in them. And while the Frankfurt School was neo-Marxist, many of its adherents were really less concerned or interested in economics and redistribution of wealth than in remaking and transforming society through attitudinal and cultural change. They incorporated Marxist class theory into sociology and psychology while also assimilating Freud's theory on sexuality. Thus, Marx's theory of the dialectic of perpetual conflict was joined together with F Freud's neurotic ideas, creating a sort of Freudian Marxism. The stated goal was a total transformation of society by breaking down traditional norms and institutions such as monogamous relations and the traditional family. This was to be accomplished by promoting and legitimizing unhinged sexual permissiveness with no cultural or religious restraint. So that is in a nutshell, uh, sort of the origins of cultural Marxism. But I think it's worth um, taking a fresher course, if you will, on how Marxists succeed in subverting and taking down countries. It's instructive uh, to re-examine how Marx's number one disciple, Vladimir Lenin, pulled off the Russian Revolution with a small revolutionary force relative to a large population. Um, I was saying that it's instructive to re-examine how Marx's number one disciple, Vladimir Lenin, pulled off the Russian Revolution with a small revolutionary force relative to a large population. It was Lenin who introduced the concept of the popular front, and he coined the phrase useful idiots in describing the masses who could be manipulated into mob action of marches and protests for an ostensibly narrow cause of the popular front, which the communist vanguard, the people behind the scenes, the leaders, were using as a means for the greater revolutionary political end. This same formula has been used in almost every revolutionary power seizure of the 20th century, from Mao's cultural revolution in China, to Castro's takeover of Cuba, to Allende's takeover of Chile, to Chavez's takeover of Venezuela. So <clears throat> now let's talk about where things are today, and then let's go to Q&A. Conditions today for revolutionary change in America are much more advanced than they were in the 1960s and 70s for two basic reasons. And I, I was uh, in high school in the, in, the 19, in the latter 1960s, uh, went to college in 1970. So I remember that period reasonably well. And it was a crazy period, but I'd argue that things are actually more precarious today than they were then. So first, Americans uh, have been subjected to more than two generations of being conditioned psychologically and culturally in both overt and subliminal ways of secular progressive themes of class, gender, and race conflict, white guilt, the devaluation of human life, <clears throat> and the alleged immoral basis of the founding of the United States, much of which has been accepted and promoted through our educational system, through K through 12 and the universities, the media and Hollywood. And the second big difference, what makes it different today than it was back in the 60s and 70s, it was actually in the 70s that leaders of the American radical left recognized that they could change the course of the nation over time by getting elected to state and local governments. Where building a socialist revolution in stages, so to speak, could be pulled off by playing to the entitlement attitudes uh, in the poor inner cities in America. So where we're, you know, where we're at now, 
uh, is that things have things have sped up very very fast in terms of revolutionary change. It's hard to believe that that George Floyd was uh, was uh, was killed by the white cop on May 25th and within 24 hours, there were riots across the United States in major cities. You know, I've looked at the, the evidence and analyzed it, and it's very clear that those plans were already in place, awaiting a match to basically start the fire. And the death of George Floyd, unfortunate as it was, tragic as it was, uh, wrong as it was, nonetheless was used to bring about this revolution. And of course, preceding this, our country was in a shutdown from COVID-19. So we have a, we have a number of different things going on at the same time that make us very vulnerable. And I, I, I really appreciated the, the former speaker's optimistic view, and I'm an optimist myself, but the reality of what we're facing is very serious. And I think part of what we want to do at Discovery Institute is to empower all of you to really understand what's going on and uh, to develop the courage to address these things. Because part, part of our problem is that good people are not doing enough. And as Edmund Burke once said, all it takes for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. So we don't want to do nothing. And Discovery Institute is is uh, committed to doing all that we can to educate and enlighten people about what's going on, the reality of today, the positive things, but also the reality of what we're facing right now. So with that, I would love to answer your questions. So I'll uh, start answering some of the questions. If you can maybe put Scott and I side by side in the window, if that's possible, that'd be awesome. Uh, Harry asks, do you see the internal inconsistencies of Marxist theory as an indicator of an ine inevitable failure of these movements, or will they influence culture so much that the formal success of their movement will become irrelevant? Oh, I think the latter is true. The former doesn't really matter. The inconsistency, the failure of Marxist theory, Marxist theory was basically a fraud. And, and what Lenin taught us is that in order to pull off the revolution, you just need well-placed people uh, that can man manipulate the masses, confuse them, disarm them, and you can seize power. And what we're seeing in America today is that so many people feel very disarmed. They feel, you know, they, they don't wanna be shamed they don't want to be accused of being a, a racist or a white supremacist. And what I left out of my discussion, because I can't cover everything, was the contribution that Saul Alinsky made to this heritage of Marxism. Alinsky really gave people sort of the street, uh, so, sort of the, 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 ten revol uh, the, the 10 rules for revolution gave the revolutionary the ability basically to defeat the opponent. And you defeat the opponent sometimes by marginalizing them, ridiculing them. You don't talk about the issues. You can't win on the issues. Alinsky recognized that you can't debate the, the people who understand economics, that understand public policy, that understand history and, 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 and the heritage of civilization. You can't win those debates. So you don't have those debates. You ridicule and marginalize those people. And, and that's essentially what the mob is doing today. I mean, it started out with, you, you know, with destruction of property, which quickly moved to pulling down statues which is basically, of course, a move to undermine our heritage, to, to disconnect us from the history of our great country. Excellent. So uh, we have another question in from Scott. 
Um, and he's basically saying in, in many cities, whether it's Seattle or Minneapolis or New York or San Francisco, uh, if someone speaks up, they're likely to be doxxed or, uh, uh, or, or, or face an attempted cancellation. Uh, how can we effectively combat this cultural Marxism that has in, infiltrated uh, our city's bureaucracy uh, and culture? So I, I guess the question is, um, people are afraid to speak out against this. Uh, what are some strategies or tactics that, that they can develop to uh, fight back? Well, the first thing I would do is to pray every day. And you pray to God to get, that you have the strength and the courage to face the enemy and that you don't back down in calling things as you see it. You know, you're speaking truth to power. Right now, it would appear that the left has the cultural power. But we have the real power because we have the truth. So you just, there's no easy answer to it. But what I've always tried to do in my professional life in writing is I try to get my written word disseminated to audiences that are not necessarily familiar with the ideas that I'm sharing. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's easy to preach to the choir, as they say. Uh, and that's one of the problems that conservatives have is that they, their ideas circulate among themselves and they don't get out to the wider population. And so each one of you at the seminar, you have to think of yourself as an ambassador, as a missionary, as a person that can take truth to unenlightened people. And you start out modestly and simply, um, but m many of these people, I feel very sorry for so many of these street, you know, these hoodlums and thugs, these useful idiots, really. Many of them are from broken homes. They are not happy with themselves. And rather than turning to things to improve themselves and, and so forth, they, they find a company with other disaffected people. And that's uh, essentially how these how these, um, these mobs, if you will, operate. They, they, they have, a, in, in a way, a community of like-minded, disaffected people. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, I'll, I'll take another stab too, I think building on what Scott is saying. Um, I know there's another question, how do you fight back against cancel culture? And, and I think those are essentially the same question. So, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this and my idea on it has evolved considerably. Um, uh, folks have attempted to cancel me many times. Uh, I'm still here. I'm still standing. Uh, folks have even used very aggressive tactics against me, against my family. Uh, we've had vandalism and stalking and intimate, physical intimidation. Uh, and and I, I think my kind of initial strategic mindset was kind of brush it off, blow it off, um, uh, keep going, keep your head up, take the high ground, uh, you know, uh, kind of the, the within the realm of, of civic discourse. But I, I think that what I've learned and I think what we are starting to learn and more broadly is that, especially with the kind of media cancel culture, um, you know, that kind of take the high road approach is not adequate and not enough. And I think that uh, increasingly the, the the theory that I'm operating under and, and I'm starting to see get out there in, in kind of starting form is if cancel culture is an arms race, we need to reach parity. We need to have a strategic kind of uh, weapons grade parity. And, uh, and what we really need to do is, um, first of all, cancellation is almost a choice. You have to let people cancel you. So I think that it, you can get knocked down, you can get beat up, you can get smeared in the media, but if you just get up and keep going, um, really ultimately it's a moral choice that you make, whether you accept the, the kind of judgment uh, of, the, of the kind of an extreme minority or not. But second, I think we have to start fighting back. And I would say two things have happened recently that are very encouraging. One is that a friend of mine, Balaji Srinivasan, who's a technologist, he was the CTO of Coinbase, the largest Bitcoin company, he had an ongoing fight with a New York Times reporter named Taylor Lawrence, and uh, he actually ended up putting out a bounty for the meanest memes attacking Taylor Lawrence. He put out a bounty to get uh, articles retracted. 
used very aggressive tactics and, um, and eventually the New York Times has really backed off a lot of their misbehavior. Second, Tucker Carlson himself. Um, the New York Times was threatening to dox him and his residence and he called them out and he threatened to dox them right back and the New York Times backed down. So I, I think that you need to operate kind of on those two, two, two frames. You have the kind of reaching out, um, uh, kind of persuading people through good ideas, but you also need to be able to be tough uh, and, and operate with a position of power. I'm wondering, Scott, what, what you might think about, about both of those. Well, I, <clears throat> three cheers to Chris Rufo. I fully agree, man. <laughs> you are you are a, a great example for all of us. I've I've uh, you know I applaud you for your contributions and your uh, of course when you're on TV like I've seen you on TV uh, numerous times uh, you you can't show that that fighting or talk about that fighting spirit but uh, in your private life um, and elsewhere when you're not in the limelight of of television um, I fully agree with you. It's it's very sad that we've come to this. And I guess, you, you know, the, the contradictions are so deep in the left today that you almost wonder if it isn't going to just self-destruct and implode. And we hope that it will. Um, you know, the election coming up is very important. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that I, I think that, that the silent majority in America is probably larger today than it was uh, four years ago, but mm. you just don't know. You know, one of the signs that I have been reflecting on and looking at these protests, you see it very frequently. You, you, you see signs uh, and the people that carry them probably really don't, don't know what it means, it, but, it, but it's, uh, it's propaganda. It's, um, it's the signs read, uh, no, you know, no justice, no peace. No, you know, if you don't give us justice, you're not going to get peace. So, so what is that? What, what is justice? Well, I think the immediate justice that certainly the Democrat Party believes is, you know, these these riots will go away if you get Donald Trump out of office. If you deliver a Democrat victory, you're going to have peace. Of course, uh, that's, that, that's, you know, probably not entirely true, but, but this notion that, that um, we can be silenced, that we can be canceled. It's very troubling when you really have an appreciation for this country and, and our Bill of Rights, our First Amendment. I mean, we live in such a blessed country. When you compare our country and how we have progressed through time, it's, it's an extraordinary story. And to think that it would be canceled out or, or uh, censored is just, you know, we traditionally we were the light to the world, and we still are. But um, we got to keep that light burning. That's for sure. Yeah, I I 100% agree with that. I think it's um, you know, you look at uh, people all over the world still love the United States, believe in the United States, want to immigrate to the United States, and it seems like the people who have forgotten that spirit are the people within the United States. It's it's quite sad. So. Uh, the next question um, uh, from Max is a great question. He's asking, what do we do from here, essentially? He says, uh, what do you see as the practical and specific ways of fixing the situation for the next generation? Is it withdrawing from the public education system, withdrawing from Hollywood? Uh, is it an emphasis on withdrawal, or rather, is it an emphasis on a counterattack or marching back through the institutions? Is that even possible nowadays? Well, I think both of those should be pursued. I think in some ways you have to pick your spots where you're going to fight. So you, you would want to withdraw from things that are just not going to likely be where the odds are not great uh, of, of being, um, of making a difference. But where you can make a different difference, you really want to invest yourself. So I think when you think about the culture in the media, I mean, we already are seeing the rise of alternative media. I mean, it's been going on for some time, but 
if anything, it's probably gaining momentum. Um, it, it, it's not just Fox anymore. It's, uh, you know, it's Newsmax, it's OAN. And then of course you have all, you, you know, you have a myriad of, of um, sites, on, online sites that can give you insight and commentary on what's going on. So that's very positive. It, it's hard to believe that, uh, you know, if, if our star is rising in the media, <clears throat> in, that, in that part of the culture, we're just talking about media right now, and the star of the mainstream media is falling, what's the future there? It looks pretty good for us, frankly. The star of the mainstream media is not, is declining. Their viewerships are falling. So uh, on, on the education side, you know, my, my daughter uh, is, you know, we would have never sent her to public school, but I, I, I do think that, that there are some public schools probably uh, that might be okay, but um, I think where you can and you can afford it, I think finding, finding an alternative. I'm hoping that Donald Trump, uh, if he's reelected, will do more with bringing about a, cor a corrective in what I call the knowledge industry. The knowledge industry is what shapes the culture, and the knowledge industry includes the, all of the media, the social media, and includes the school system, K through 12, and higher education, the universities, the colleges and universities. And we have a First Amendment, and if, if uh, schools cannot protect the First Amendment, they ought to lose federal funding. That, that'd be an easy thing to do. Um, that could really change things to some extent, I think. It, it, it's a tougher road to, to reform the school system, the public school system, you know, it's, it's unionized and it's, but I think if it, through patience, remember the, the long march through the institutions that the cultural Marxists have taken over two generations. Think if we could march through the, through the educational institutions uh, for a generation or two. Uh, I think we'd have a, you know, we, we'd have a, an, a, a huge impact. But the hour is late right now. So it's a, it, it's sort of, uh, Manning the barricades and uh, and and getting some strategic victories here and there. I mean that's how warfare works. You need you need a turning point. We haven't really gotten to there. You know when you go back and you study the American Revolution, you know the colonial army lost more battles than they ever won. But they had you know they had a turning point. You know. I think Washington's crossing of the Delaware was, was a turning point. Um, so we, we need to get some strategic victories and maybe that's worth talking about a little bit, maybe in, in another session of Q and A. If yeah, we could I mean, identify, you know, when you're, when you're looking for a solution, you wanna first come up with options, right? Here are the options that we could take to, to solve the problem. So let's talk about that. What, what, are the, what are the options we could come up with where we, have a high degree or a reasonably high degree of securing a strategic victory. I think that's exactly right. And, and my read of the kind of rights, political history, uh, especially, uh, you know, it, since I was uh, kind of a, a, a human being in the 1980s, um, you know, it, it, it really feels like we have been largely stuck in kind of uh, the kind of, uh, kind of, 1980s kind of conservative establishment ideas and it seems like we've now broken out with with the election in 2016 it got big change and my sense is what's needed now is exactly what you're arguing we need a a new strategic vision because uh, at, at, you know like it or not in the world of Ronald Reagan the large institutions were conservative they were viewed as the establishment the kind of radicals uh, that were fighting against it when you were growing up in the in, in 1960s were fighting against the kind of conservative elements that run the universities and the social sciences and the public bureaucracies. But uh, I think conservatives have to really realize we're in now the opposite position. 
our position, you know, on the actual terrain is much more like the 60s student radicals than it is the people they're fighting against. And, and I wonder if we need to really update our entire operating mindset and think, well, you know, we're now on the outside looking in and we, how do we now transition to think of a new strategy? And I, I'd like to maybe ask you to offer a couple of remarks. What could be some even, you know, suggestions for that kind of new strategy, new vision uh, to, to, to adapt to our current circumstance? Well, I, I think <clears throat> one of the things that I think are important for everybody to, to do is to have arrows in their, in their quiver. So if you're going to be engaging people, your friends, family, whomever, um, be strategic about where you can engage them, but have arrows that will penetrate. In other words, don't develop, you know, if you can, you know, none of us can be good at all things, but we can be good at a few things. So develop your, your line of argument, if you will, your, 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 um, yeah, your, your line of argument in such a way that it's in, that you can win, that, that you can't, you can't be taken down. You know, you want to stand on solid ground. So that would be one suggestion. Absolutely. All right. Well, really appreciate it. We've had a, a, an action-packed uh, morning and afternoon. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. So here, uh, I'm going to briefly go over the schedule for tomorrow. We're starting at the same time, 9 a.m. East or 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, rather, uh, noon Eastern time. Uh, we're going to open up. Uh, we're going to have George Gilder back at the very beginning. He's going to be talking about technology, creativity, and surprise. So we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into kind of the secrets and of entrepreneurship and the, the creative spirit. Um, uh, entrepreneur Matt Scholes, who's doing unbelievable work, uh, looking at DNA, looking at uh, kind of biotechnology. Uh, he's uh, been the CEO of multiple very successful companies. Uh, he's gonna be talking about information theory and how it relates to uh, his uh, practical work uh, looking to uh, fight uh, cancer and other diseases. Uh, Jay Richards, who you all met earlier, is going to have a full session. Uh, he's now writing a book uh, about uh, COVID-19, and he's going to share some early uh, research and materials on that. Um, the session's called Life After COVID. Um, and then uh, wrapping up the day is going to be Ed Moy, who is the director of the U.S. Mint. Uh, he's going to be talking about money uh, and, and, and time and all of the themes that we've touched on a bit early with George and then with Gail Pooley. So it's gonna be another great day. Um, we're gonna be talking uh, really under the broad theme of knowledge and power. So we're gonna be kind of going all in into technology and development and information uh, at disease and, uh, and all sorts of fascinating technological themes. So we hope to see you. And uh, in the meantime, uh, if you are one of the 19 Gilder Fellow students uh, that registered as students and we're gonna to come to Seattle uh, but we had to obviously change format. Uh, we have a virtual hangout session with George and the other speakers uh, starting in five minutes. So uh, Eric Nutley emailed you a link to a separate Zoom meeting so we can see your faces. We can be a little more interactive. Uh, so please log on now. We'll be uh, booting back up with the whole team, the whole panel uh, in, in the next uh, five minutes. So uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your brilliant <laughs> questions. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, we're very excited. This is our first uh, online Gilder Seminars. Uh, we're very excited to bring it uh, to all of you. So uh, Gilder Fellows, stay tuned. Log into the next meeting in five minutes. Uh, and then the, the, the other attendees, uh, thank you so much. We will be seeing you uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m.